Okay. Okay. There are some side effects. Okay. They're not like side effects of chemo, right. <laughs> which yes. are devastating. Right. It's, it's, to me, nothing to be afraid of at this point, right? Because for him, I mean, you know, not to be, you know, dramatic about it, but it's life and death. I mm -hmm. mean, they, they, you're not getting any other options here. And right. as a mom myself, right. I would do it in a heartbeat, knowing what I know and seeing what I've seen. Okay. Okay? Yes, ma'am. What kind of medicine are we giving her? Um, turmeric. Turmeric? Mm. Yeah. She doesn't care if it's spicy. She loses to it. Oh, what a brave girl. She's brave. And then what else do you give her? I give her black medicine. What do you give the black medicine on? Ice cream. An ice cream? What kind of ice cream? The good kind. Watch her and take a black medicine. You're going to give your baby black meds? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, what does that do? Make the cancer go away. I was deathly afraid when I realized we were on the oncology ward. Like, I remember them saying, you have to wash your hands before and after you leave the room, because we're in the oncology, oncology. And I was like, it was like 4 in the morning. I'm like, what does oncology mean? I'm sorry if I'm, <laughs> like, I don't know what this means. And she's like, this is the cancer. And then that's when it hit me that my daughter, like, literally had cancer. They sat me down. They're like, this is a 97% curable rate. She's going to finish this treatment. She will go on to live a long, healthy life. The side effects are very minimal. Like, you have nothing to worry about it. Just, like, trust us. We'll get you through this. She has the best cancer that you can have. So we really did trust them. She went through her six months of chemotherapy and then we went about four months out of treatment without any evidence of the disease. I remember I was at work and I got a call from, from Jacqueline saying that, you know, she was breathing weird, something wasn't right. So we took her in the emergency room and she was diagnosed with stage four complete metastasis. Her right lung was covered top to bottom with cancer. And this time she would have four medications. You have to have two new ones um, because as Everyone knows um, cancer cells, they become resilient to chemotherapy, so you have to up it, it has to be stronger. This one was much more aggressive and harsh, and right away, I mean, we could see her. I mean, just all the life that was in her was gone. She was three and a half and 19 pounds. Yeah. We didn't know if she would survive it. It wasn't looking very good for her, and the hospital could not guarantee her long-term survival. And so we were able to opt out of treatment, which is very rare. It was an unpopular decision. I, I personally did not believe she was going to survive the next round of chemotherapy. I think my worst fear was obviously losing my daughter at home at my own hands. And my uncle told us about the cannabis oil. He gave me some to try. Yeah, I was, I thought it was, I got liquid gold. I was like, let's go. <laughs> So three months after we opted out, we did a scan, and the 4.2 was down to 1.62 millimeters, and the one that was slightly over one millimeter was completely gone. And of course, we believe that it was definitely the cannabis. Wow, can you give him vessels? I can honestly tell you here right now that my daughter would not be alive today if we had not done it. I, I believe 100% that she is here because of that, because of cannabinoids and because of our faith in God. I don't doubt that it's definitely cannabis oil, but we just don't know what's in it. I mean, one of the problems with it not being regulated and it not being controlled is that you don't know what you... I mean, you just have to trust that the people that you're getting it from are doing it the right way. Um, and I was just a bit concerned because when I opened this, it smelled kind of solventy. But they said to leave it out to breathe. But it would be interesting to know what the components of this were. It shouldn't be like that, should it? There should be a place where you can go to and you can get advice, you can get it tailored to the to the treatment, tailored to this one at night, this one in the morning. I mean, we, it should be available and it just isn't, and that's why we're all <laughs> floundering in the dark, really. Oh, it's okay. Can I try some of this? 
safe. Yes, nice oh, to meet you. So nice to meet you. Come I'm on so in. sorry it's to okay. take you so long it's to okay. get here. Yes. This is Dr. Raybar. Hi. Hi. I'm coming, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> My job is public health and safety to make sure there's nothing here like solvents or pesticides or, you know, microbiological contaminants that could cause harm in those fashions. We've been kind of doing it in the dark, really, yeah. so I'd be really grateful to hear. Yeah. No, so, I mean, in the information age, you can get a lot of bad information and some oh, good the info. Problem, yeah. That to me is a little bit solventy, but it's not too bad. Do you think that's horribly solventy? That smells really, I mean, you can let Maybe Jeff smell it, but it smells uh, very solventy yeah, to me. Yeah, something, something different. Well, there's definitely a little this alcohol, but it one. smells smell. like rubbing alcohol. Yeah. Smell that one. Not that, like that ethanol. One's Let's try that one. That one stinks. That one I thought wasn't too bad. Oh, that's rubbing alcohol. That's isopropanol. You should not be eating that. No, that's no good. They and they do use. Oh, that, that, that is rubbing it's alcohol. Rubbing alcohol. That's not ethanol. No. That's not food grade. That smells alcohol. like. That and smells you're, like the alcohol. You're giving him the. To no, the, not oh, that one. No. I don't know if you've given him tremendously large amounts that you need to be concerned mm. about complete damage, but it will. You know, be more difficult on the liver to Sorry. metabolize that, and it could mm -hmm. cause damage okay. to certain cells. When they're on chemo yeah. and they're on other medications, the liver is already on. Yeah. You know, it's pretty busy, so we yeah. don't want to make it work worse. Right. Right. Chico's not gonna. He's okay. Okay. Yeah. And here's the other travesty: three thousand wow. dollars. Three thousand three hundred. Three thousand for for those three tiny little pots. That's disturbing. Yeah. A lot. It's the hardest part of what we do because I always have to be the disseminator of bad news. Yeah. The government will let us start testing it for medicinal purposes. That will help yeah. as well because right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're only allowing tests to happen that show how it can hurt you, not how it can help you. I believe it and was, then, yeah, 6% yeah. of the studies are currently funded for good purposes and 94% yeah. are looking bad. at bad purposes. Yeah. The U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse. NIDA funds the vast majority of drug abuse research, not just in the United States, but in the world. The way they encourage scientists and researchers was all about trying to identify harms. Congress um, in 1970 placed uh, marijuana in the Schedule I category, high potential for abuse, no medical use and treatment. Marijuana is in the same category with heroin and LSD. Cocaine is in a lower category, Schedule II, because it has legitimate medical uses in some limited areas. Unfortunately, we still have this block of the Schedule One status. So the federal government is telling us there's not enough research on cannabis to deschedule it from Schedule One, and then they're saying, but we can't, you can't do research because it's Schedule One. So it's put us in this really horrible position. The DEA is blocking recognition that this is science on marijuana's medical efficacy and you, you just can't be in the dark about that and say there's no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States that's, and no standard for safety. That's, that's a lie. The first evidence that cannabis may have anti-cancer activity actually came from our National Cancer Institute in 1974. But mysteriously, those lines of investigation disappeared when I started downloading studies like five years ago, there were like 450 just on reference breast cancer. And now there's, there's maybe 30 on there. Where'd all those go? Where'd they go? Why'd they go off PubMed.gov? Why is the government taking those studies off? Luckily, there's research going on in other countries that hopefully it will be able to use to make a case um, to deschedule marijuana in the United States. There are no prescriptions in America. There's recommendations. Doctors aren't allowed to prescribe cannabis, they're allowed to recommend it. In Israel, every one of the patients is prescribed cannabis. It's a federal license. And because it's a federal license, the growers grow federally, the patients use federally, so research that's overseen by the federal government is then being conducted. So you don't have that block. So the research started here in the 60s. We, we were gifted with Professor Mishulam. He isolated the cannabinoid THC. How come morphine had been isolated from opium 150 years previously, and cocaine had been isolated from coca leaves 100 years previously, and the active compound in cannabis had never been isolated in pure form. Its structure was unknown, so it was impossible to do any biological work. In science, Israel is a very liberal country. While in the US, 
it was very difficult to do cannabis work. Here we had absolutely no problems. Dadi is the epitome of science. The go by the book, study for your eight PhDs, and work on, on, on curing cancer type of guy working with cannabis, which is unheard of today. When you uh, put cannabis extract or THC and CBD, which are the main cannabinoids in the extract, it can really kill the cancer. In a way, we call it apoptosis. Actually, the cells commit suicide. Every cell in our body have like a checkpoint that they are checking if there is a problem. And if there is a problem, they will kill themselves. They will commit suicide. So what we see is that cannabis is giving the cancer cells back this ability that they lost. In the first row, we can see colon cancer cell lines growing in the plate. Every dot like this is a cell. When we're adding cannabis strain number three, CB3, we see all the cells are dying here. 100% of the cells died here. What is even more interesting in this image is when we are growing colon cells, which are not cancer cells, and we're adding strain number three, nothing has happened, okay? When we're adding the same strain to the colon cancer cells, they died. When we're adding it to the normal cells, they're not dying, it's not affecting them. The same thing with strain number four. In this image, it's very important. We see we're adding strain number three and four that kill the colon cancer and the breast cancer. Here it's not affecting the prostate cancer. So it's very important to understand which materials we have in these strains. What are the pattern of cannabinoids and terpenes there and why it's affecting one cancer and not the other. We've been in the field of cannabis for about 20 years. Well, we started to do experiments uh, with cancer cells and we were expecting all the results. We were doing metabolic studies and what we saw was something completely un unexpected. We were killing cancer cells. So these are one of the first experiments we performed with animals. We treated immune deficient mice. So we injected glioblastoma human cells underneath the skin and we generated these tumors. And half of the animals were treated with cannabinoids, in this case with THC, and the other half uh, received no cannabinoid treatment. The tumors of these animals that were not treated with cannabinoids are way bigger than these other tumors. More recently we have been working on breast cancer and, and here we represent tumor volume how big the tumors are as time passes. And this is how tumors that are not treated with cannabinoids behave. They grow. And this is the THC-treated population. As you can see, they have less metastasis in the lungs, and they have less tumors per animal than the control group. So it works pretty well as well. We are also realistic, and we know that there are many therapies that have worked finally in mice, and then they fail when they go to humans. Of course, we need robust clinical trials to get to know finally, at last, whether cannabinoids can be or not anti-tumor agents in precise patient subpopulations. Good morning, Sophie. Hi, my love. Oh, big stretch. Good morning, honey. So today is um, the big day. Today is the first scans that we're going to be getting to see if um, what we're doing is working. You're gonna get a nice nap, Sophie. Yeah, baby doll. You're gonna get to go to sleep really soon. Dude. You're gonna get a nice little nap, baby girl. Hi. Mixed in with no, no, no. Just like NS foot, like your little flusher, and then following by this foot. This is this. This is 30 units. So we're headed home from scan day. <coughs> Sophie is very unhappy. The anesthesia is making her really super cranky, and she's tired. And the radiologist said that she would read them by the end of the day today, so we're hoping to get information pretty quickly. Hello? Hi, hold on, I'm trying to get it on speakerphone. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, hi guys. Yeah. Hi. So, um, I'm not sure if you got a chance to glance at the MRI. Um, you know, 
know, unfortunately it does look a little worse than it did um, back in June. So that means we got to start chemo ASAP. I think our trajectory is unfortunately chemo. So when do we have to start? So I think we can start this week. And then we can spend some time in the office and go over everything again. <laughs> It's not smaller, it's not stable, and that means chemo. Which is just, it's like really, really, really hard to imagine what that's gonna be like.